to tell you this morning that God is interested in your joy. You feel full of joy today? Maybe uh, you would ask me the question, okay, <laughs> Andrew, what's the catch? God's in it for my joy? What? That's not what I understand as I look through the, the scriptures. It looks more like God is a killjoy than a person that leads to joy. Well, that's what we want to talk about this morning. That God is interested in your joy. But what we're going to find this morning is that um, the only way to experience joy that endures, joy that lasts, is to set your affection on the greatest, the greatest essence of, of worth and value. Not to set your focus or, your, or anchor your heart in your uh, fulfillment or satisfaction in, in lesser things, but to anchor it in the thing, the one, I should say, that is enduring, the one of supreme value, and of course, that is God himself. Now, when I was a kid, I had uh, an object of joy. There was something that I had asked my parents for. They, once in a while, and this was a, maybe a once-in-a-lifetime experience uh, in, in my home, they said, hey, uh, we would like to get you a special gift, and so they took me to the store and they let, they let me down the aisle of all these bicycles, okay? <laughs> and man, my eye was drawn to the only bicycle that really mattered in that store. Man, that was a desert cat, a 1978 Murray, man. It was, it was the object of my affection. It was the pinnacle of what was really going to make me macho in my community. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, I thought that was the best bicycle ever. Now, it had some limitations, though, and the front tire is not quite as agile as you would like it to be, so going around corners was a little harder, and, uh, and I found myself running into things a lot more often than I had hoped. And of course, as my friends grew up, um, not having a 10-speed was left me in the dust, and so the joy that was as high as could be early on was a joy that began to diminish over the years. As I realized that I was growing out of this bike and it wasn't able to perform the, the same macho functions that it once did. I realized that I had set my affections on a passing joy. But there is a greater joy. There is an ultimate joy. A joy that will sustain you. A joy that will carry you through every situation. And it is a joy that is only found in God. Peter talks a little bit about this joy in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says uh, to this group of exiles, those who were pilgrims of this dispersion, who had been scattered around, who were experiencing a measure of persecution and suffering in the various locations that they found themselves. But all had one common connection, and that was a connection to uncommon joy. He says, though you have not seen him, of course, speaking about Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. God is interested in your joy. Joy that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Joy that is characterized this way. That Peter couldn't even begin to describe how amazing this joy is. He didn't even have words for it. He could only say, inexpressible and full of glory. I can't even begin to tell you about this joy, Peter says. I don't even want to try. I'm just going to capture it with a word. It is inexpressible. And that is the joy that God offers to all of us in this room through the person of Jesus Christ. George Mueller, you may know him, 
said, talked about joy this way. He said, the more we know of God, the happier we are. When we became a little acquainted with God, our true happiness commenced. And the more we became acquainted with him, the more truly happy we become. What will make us so exceedingly happy in heaven? It will be the fuller knowledge of God. You see, salvation is just the beginning of joy in God. Salvation is just the start line of the gospel in your life. The finish line will happen as God captures us away and lets us spend eternity with him in heaven. And the gospel begins to, to shape our life and to call us to greater things, to call us to Jesus, to call us to joy that transcends every experience, every circumstance. Jonathan Edwards put it this way. He says, God is glorified not only by his glory being seen, but by its being rejoiced in. When those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than if they only see it. Are we people this morning who are delighting in the person of Christ? Are we people this morning who are delighting in the glory of God? who are satisfied with him, and that satisfaction in God transcends every other dissatisfaction because your satisfaction in him is anchored, it's true, it is unwavering because he is unwavering. That's the goal, to abounding joy that will not be quenched. And that's where we come this morning in our study of Ezra chapter 6. Those of you who have been with us will know that we're studying about a group of exiles who had been taken into captivity. And uh, because of their fathers and grandfathers and on back through their forefathers, the discipline of God was heavy upon them as a people so that Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed and the walls were destroyed and they were taken into captivity for 70 years there in Babylon. And by God's grace, they were brought back to Jerusalem and began to work on the altar and then began to work on the foundation of the temple. And last week, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that, uh, that they are committed to that task because of the word of God, the spirit of God, and the people of God. What I want us to see this morning is what helped to sustain them in the midst of this new conflict, this new adversity that they would be met with. So if you would please turn with me to Ezra chapter 6. It's there on page 392 if you're a guest with us and you're using the Pew Bible there in front of you. This morning I want to give you a glimpse of what helps lead to joy. And what we're going to see this morning is that what leads to joy is not just obedience, but what leads to joy is enduring faith in God, which will then result in obedience. It was the faith that was deeply rooted in God that helped them to do and endure in what God had called them to do, not just obedience in itself. And the end point of faith the end point of obedience and commitment to God is joy. We see that in Hebrews chapter 12, and I just want to read this for you real quick. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You see, joy is the end point of faith. So if you want to experience joy, you need to be a person who is rested and anchored and founded in faith in God. The unwavering foundation. And so this morning we're going to look through seven characteristics of enduring faith. The kind of faith that leads to joy. If you want to experience joy, this is what will be true about your faith. Let me read for us. Uh, we're going to be trying to cover two chapters this morning. Okay? And seven points. 
So let's pray that God helps us get through this. It's really great. <laughs> I hope, we, hope we're able to make it through. First is found in Ezra chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Here's what it says. At the same time, Tetanai, the governor of the province of beyond the river, and Shethar Bazanai and their associates came to them and spoke to them. Who gave you a decree to build this house to finish this structure? They also asked them, what are the names of the men who are building this building? But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. The first mark of enduring faith is faith that strengthens our dependence on God. Faith that strengthens our dependence on God. Now, of course, faith and dependence are kind of synonymous terms. But that's exactly what we see here. We see a group of individuals who have heard the word of God, who have been awakened by the Holy Spirit, and who are now committed to do what God has said. And depending on him through the midst of this conflict and interaction that they're facing to continue to move forward in dependence on God to sustain them and to help them. The work had commenced, and now the governor from beyond the river is coming to face them. Now, unlike what we saw in the previous chapter, notice it does not title this group of associates as adversaries like we saw back in chapter 4. You see, Tatnai would have been the governor of the entire region west of the Euphrates. And we find ourselves now underneath the reign of King Darius. This is only the second year. We, we've seen that a couple of times in our study the last couple of weeks. So in any transition of government, especially a government that is, uh, that is now transitioned to a new king, there, of course, is going to be an uprising that's taking place throughout the region as they've conquered several different nations. And in order to, to put down the revolts, as it were, there, there needed to be a reestablishment of authority. This would have been a very difficult time for Darius as a new king over Persia and Sure enough, the first two years of Darius' reign were punctuated by uprisings and conflicts within the empire. So Tetanai did what any good government official who was overseeing this western part of the, of the empire would do. He wanted to make sure that things that were taking place, that were happening there, were happening in a way that was in accordance to the instructions and decrees given by Persia itself. Tetanai probably would have been um, uh, his capital, the, the city of his dwelling, and it would have been somewhere near Damascus, about 150 miles away from Jerusalem, anywhere between a week and two weeks away. And it's not clear from looking at this passage how long it took them to show up, but it was somewhere towards the beginning of, of the of the rebuilding of this, of this temple. So it would have been natural that the authorities of this western province would have come to inspect this new building. But no doubt, this new threat would have conjured up fresh hurts. It would have ripped open old wounds, even if it was done in a way that, uh, that was appropriate. Those who were in Jerusalem would have been reminded of what had happened 16 years before. But God was going to graciously work in the hearts of these people, not only to call them to obedience and call them to faith, but to help make that possible. God used the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah to do just that. We find this consistent ministry of divine revelation to these people. Haggai, who would have preached in the sixth month, in the seventh month, and twice in the ninth month. And those gaps would have been filled by Zechariah, who covered the eighth month and the eleventh month. For six months now, the ministry of these prophets was continuing to echo in the hearts, in the minds, and in the ears of these people. God is for you. Build a temple. 
God will strengthen you. Build a temple. This is the purpose. I am with you. Keep moving. This ministry of the prophets that continued to sound out the instructions of God, making it absolutely clear. The question would be, would they trust him and obey what he has said? We find the response in verse 5. It says, But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. You see, the eye of God was on the people. They had determined in their hearts that they would be people who obeyed. And because of their willingness and commitment to depend on God, they got to see God show up for them. They got to see the eye of their God who is on them, assisting them, allowing them to continue the work. It was not until they committed themselves to obedience they began to see the work of God in their situation and and God begins to show up in greater ways among his people. We see the continuing work of God in their lives as we move to verses 6, chapter 5, verse 6, on through chapter 6, verse 12. In this section, what we're going to see, we're not going to be able to read through it in its entirety. I'll try to explain it and summarize it for you. We're going to see that faith reveals the sovereignty of God. Enduring faith is the kind of faith that reveals the sovereignty of God. And when I talk about the sovereignty of God, I talk about the authority of God. I talk about the supremacy of God. I I talk about a God who works and acts for his own purposes. A God who is able to to work in the hearts of his people, but also work in the hearts of those who are not his people. Faith had led them now to be able to see firsthand the sovereignty of God. We see that, like I said, in verses 6 of chapter 5 on through verse 12 of chapter 6. Faith gives way to watch God work If they had bowed to pressure, if they had removed themselves from this work again, they would not have been able to see the sovereignty of God working on their behalf. What takes place in the rest of chapter 5 is a letter, a letter that is written to Darius, a letter that kind of describes the, the circumstances, the events that are taking place. We find in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, excuse me, before I get there, this letter that is, that is, uh, that is written by Tetanai begins to describe exactly what is taking place, that uh, this delegation of individuals is coming to challenge the work that is happening there, questions that are being asked about what is taking place and, and describing the, the work itself, the, the, the stones and the timber that are being used and the, dilig- the diligence of the people in committing themselves to the task. He then describes the approach of, of himself and his delegation, the questions that they asked and the responses that they got. What are you doing? Who, who, what are the names of those who are building this temple? And then he makes a recommendation to Darius to do a search, to look for a decree that had been described to him, the decree from Cyrus to to send the people back to Jerusalem and to begin the work on the temple. And Tatnai, in his letter, begins to to make a recommendation to Darius that Darius would would do a search and, and see if, in fact, there was authority for these Jews to do this work there in Jerusalem. Well, in chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, Darius gets this letter. And in verses 2 and 3, he then begins to make a decree for the, this document, this, this decree by Cyrus to be searched for. That's where we find ourselves in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Let me just read this for you. It says, And in Ecbatana, the citadel that is in the province of Media, A scroll was found on which this was written, a record 
In the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where sacrifices were offered, and let its foundations be retained. Now we begin to understand the sovereignty of God. Just a glimpse, just an indication of the, of the working of God in the hearts of heathen kings to, to allow the work on the temple to be propagated. Darius, who, for all intents and purposes, shouldn't have given a rip about what was taking, in Jeru- taking place in Jerusalem in building this temple. Why was he going to invest his own energy, his own resources, his own time to send a delegation and even to make a decree to try to find what had been written before by King Cyrus? The fact that Darius was willing to even pursue and search out the matter is an indication of God's working in his heart. Then the fact that Darius actually goes to the lengths of not only looking in Babylon, but also looking in Ecbatana. And Ecbatana would have been the summer place, uh, the summer capital, as it were, of Persia. They would have spent their winter in Babylon. They would have spent the spring in Susa. And they would have spent the summer in Ecbatana because it was more elevated and it was cooler in the summertime. That's exactly where Cyrus spent the summer of his first year of reigning there in Ecbatana. And that's exactly where they find this decree. And in this decree, it would have been clear to Darius, who is now reading, the urgency and the force by which Cyrus was sending this exiled group of individuals back to Jerusalem. Not only the permission to go, but capturing the dimensions of the temple. And if you have time, you can read through that even captures the specific dimensions of all the, all the, the, uh, the places of the temple itself, uh, how tall, how wide, how long this temple should be. But also providing for the financial needs of the work and reissuing the vessels of the temple and empowering these people to go back and, and access the lands and materials that they would need in order to build this temple. In response, Darius commands Tetanai in his letter that we find in verses 6 and following. He says in verse 6, Now therefore, Tetanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bazanai and your associates and governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. I don't know if you stand in amazement at the sovereign hand of God, not only for one king, one world emperor, to not only send the Jews back to Jerusalem, but now working again in the heart of another heathen king to accomplish his purposes, to reinforce the work, and to tell Tatnai, stay away. Leave the work alone. Let these Jews do what they have been called to do. Stand down. They would never have been able to experience the accompanying sovereignty of God, these Jews, had they not pressed in to enduring faith. They would have never been able to to recognize and understand and appreciate the power of God without faith. Well, it continues to grow. The, the, The lessons of faith continue to shine throughout this passage. Next, we find that faith enables the provision of God. Faith enables the provision of God. Faith has begun this process now of cascading blessing that begins to flow. It started as a trickle, and now it's becoming a river, a river of God's goodness on his people 
that is flowing through the channel of faith. We see in Ezra chapter 6, verse 8, the evidence of God's provision for them. It says this, Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you should do for these elders of the Jews, for the rebuilding of this house of God, the cost is to be paid for by the uh, paid to these men, and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river. You just say, "Wow." I mean, imagine for a moment that you're thinking about the best case scenario. You're there in Jerusalem. You're looking at the possibility of another conquest because of what could be assumed as rebellion within the empire. The best possible scenario is that you are allowed to continue to work. And then you get a decree that does this. A decree that says not only are they going to help and let you do the work, but they're also going to pay for the, the finances of this work. Who could have imagined that faith would have led to this? Who could have imagined that, that, that God would show up in this kind of way? It wouldn't have even registered in their wildest dreams that God would also allow the ease of this financial burden to be paid for out of the tribute from their own province. Those taxes that would normally be at their discretion to use for themselves were going to be coming out of their pockets and now going to finance the work there in Jerusalem. Their enduring faith paid off in terms of seeing the providing good hand of God on them. Is that not what we learned last year? Did we not learn that an abiding relationship with God, resting and trusting in him, leads to deliverance and salvation? As we were looking at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, it says, Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in repentance, in rest is your salvation, in quietness and in trust is your strength. And here is another visible illustration of how God is showing up for these people in extraordinary ways, unexpected ways, because of a commitment to trust. Had they failed to trust, they would have failed to experience God's providing hand. Ezra 6, 9 says this, it, it builds on itself, it actually gets better in verse 9. It says, in whatever is needed, bulls or rams or sheep for burnt offerings to God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests of Jerusalem require, let that be given to them day by day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. You pay from the treasury. Now this would have been especially important for an exiled group of individuals who've only been in the land for a few years. Because having flocks and growing herds takes time. But God, recognizing their hearts of faith and desire to dedicate the temple and to sacrifice in a way that was pleasing to him, knew the difficulty of that expense, and so he covered it for them. We find in chapter 6, verse 17, how extravagant their sacrifice and dedication was. It says that they offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and as a sin offering for all of Israel, twelve male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Faith led to provision, not only financially, but sacrificial, the sacrificial dedication God was able to cover because of their commitment to trust him in faith. But if you thought that was great, it even gets better. We find in Ezra chapter 6, 13, that faith magnifies the glory of God. Faith magnifies the glory of God. Let me read this. It says, Then according to the word sent by Darius the king, Tatani, 
uh, Darius the king, Tatnai the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bazanai and their associates did with diligence uh, what Darius the king had ordered. Faith magnifies the glory of God. Do you see the glory there? I wonder if it's easy to miss. It's not as obvious because we don't often think about the glory of God. Our faith in God, though, puts God in the spotlight. And there was no question in the minds of Tatnai and his associates who worked on behalf of those who were in Jerusalem. They said as much in their letter, and Darius said as much in his response. And here they are hustling about with all diligence in order to work out the command that Darius had given to them in response to the work of God, his sovereignty, and now God is pushed into the spotlight. God now is able to receive the glory that he alone is due because he is the only one who's going to be credited with what is taking place here in Jerusalem. You see, our faith gives the world an opportunity to observe God's amazing glory. When we choose to, when we choose to believe, it pushes God into the spotlight. But the converse is also true. When we choose not to believe, we begin to rob God of the glory and the credit that he alone deserves. Look here for a minute in chapter 5, verse 8. Look what it says. This is the letter of Tatanai and his associates. It says, Be it known to the king that we went to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones, and timber is laid in the walls. This work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. Now, I want you to identify a couple of words here. First, I want you to underline the word timber, and I want you to, to recognize this word diligently. The word diligently is only used four times in all of the Old Testament, and they, it is only used here in chapter 5 and in chapter 6, four times. There is an unmistakable connection that is intended. In chapter 5 or 6, they are describing the work on the temple as happening diligently. But then in Darius' response... <laughs> He uses their words against them, and he says the cost is to be paid by you in full, and really that's the same word, diligently. Be diligent about making good on paying and financing this work. And then in verse, chapter 6, verse 12, he says to them, let this decree be carried out with all diligence. And then in chapter 6, verse 13, what do they do? <laughs> they carry out the decree with all diligence. Now that is the work of God, and the glory of God begins to come on display. His wonder and ability to turn words against those who are complaining, to take the, the energy of the people, the diligence and the faithfulness and and to turn it against those who would oppose and, and to actually bring them into the mix of being diligent as well. God showed his power and his glory, his reputation before the people. But also, in Ezra chapter 6, verse 21, there was a, a consequence for not doing what Darius told them to do. It says, um, let me, uh, sorry, that's the wrong verse. Let me read this for us. It says in chapter 6, verse 11, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a dunghill. You see the connection? Hey, they're using big stones and timbers to build the temple, 
And Darius says, well, let me tell you about timber. Let me tell you about beams. If you don't do what I'm telling you to do and carry out with diligence, I'm going to use one of those timbers, and it's coming from your house, and I'm going to, I'm going to impale you on it. God's glory begins to shine. But what's amazing about the fact that the glory begins to show through this is what we see a hint of in chapter 6, verse 21. Speaking about the Passover that's going to happen, here's what it says. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the people of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, what in the world is happening there? Who do you see joining this Passover feast? Not only those from Israel, but those from the land who had separated themselves because of the glory of God showing up, because of the testimony of faith. And now we have a growing chorus of worshipers who are celebrating the glory of God. Unbelievable. And we have three more points to go. But we're not going to get there this morning. I want to just wrap up with this. We'll, we'll cover the rest. It's, it's not worth rushing through. Um, the question for us this morning is, how does faith show up in your life? And I think the question comes to us as we think about the gospel. And we think about how faith in God leads to obedience. We begin to realize that the, 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 the walk of faith... The Christian life is more than just these monumental leaps, like faith only shows up when I decide to be a missionary somewhere in India or Africa. But what we need to understand is that God calls us to faith moment by moment, day by day. Like for you teens, when you're doing homework and you don't feel like it, or when your parents ask you to make your beds, or they ask you to help around the house. Faith has an opportunity now to rise and for you to demonstrate a confidence in God and a desire to show His glory and a confidence in His strength and ability to do what your parents have asked you to do. For those of us who may be a little older and things are going very badly for you at work, there's an opportunity for you to say, I trust you, Lord. I don't understand what is going on, but I'm going to be anchored in the truths that you have given to me, and I will continue to work heartily as to the Lord and not to men. I don't need for people to notice me. I don't need to be recognized. I don't need that promotion for me to continue to work hard. I'm going to work as to the Lord and not to men. And whatever situation you find yourself, there is an opportunity to move moment by moment into faith, enduring faith and confidence in God. And as we do that, and only when we do that, do we give God an opportunity to bring his provision, to show his strength, to underscore that dependence on him is worthwhile. And then perhaps to even be able to lead others into the kingdom because they see God in us. Are we letting God, God's glory, are we putting it on display this morning? We can only do that through enduring faith. Let's pray. 